I'm Dr. Alfredo Tan. I'm the director of Gildard Hassa School of Computer Sciences and Engineering at Fairleigh Dickinson University. I'll be introducing our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Gregory Olson. Dr. Olson was the third private uh, citizen to travel to the International Space Station, an FDU alumnus, trustee, and benefactor. He received, uh, received three degrees from Fairleigh, a BS in Electrical Engineering, a BS in Physics, and a Master in Physics as well. He received a PhD in Material Science from University of Virginia. He's a prominent scientist. He has published more than 100 technical papers. He's a holder of 12 US patents on uh, opto, uh, optoelectronics. He's also a successful entrepreneur. How successful? Well, he sold one of his uh, high-tech companies for only for only $600 million. He's a philanthropist who gives away millions of dollars to many charitable organizations as well as nonprofit uh, organizations, including Fairleigh Dickinson University. A very modest and generous person, he gave $5 million to Fairleigh to name our school, not after himself, but after his two former FDU professor, Dr. Gildard and Dr. Hassa. We also endowed our outreach program, which uh, encourages uh, high school students, especially minorities and women, to study science and engineering. Uh, in fact, we have many students who uh, are participating in the programs from four school districts. One, we have a student from Union City, Hackensack, Patterson, and East Orange. Dr. Olson himself has personally reached out to thousands of elementary students to motivate them to study science and to work harder. He has made more than 400 inspirational talks over the years. Today, Dr. Olson will share with us his inspiring life story. He will touch upon his transformation from an underachieving high school student to a prominent PhD scientist. So we have hope here. <laughs> 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 he will talk about the challenges he encountered going to space. He will also share his immensely optimistic views about life and how we could achieve our dreams. And our dreams could be as bold, as daring, as his dream of reaching the stars. Dr. La, uh, Dr. Olson's life story will inspire us to work harder, to better ourselves, to persevere against all odds, and above all, to give back to society. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll present to you FDU's favorite son, Dr. Greg Olson. Thank you very much. Uh, while we boot up the computer again, I'll, I'll take a minute to say, uh, you're doing it? Okay, good. Uh, I'm a local boy. I grew up in Ridgefield Park, just a few miles away from here. I graduated from Ridgefield Park High School and uh, you know, went to Fairleigh for six years and then on to Virginia. Um, how many of you here struggle with math? Just a little bit, not, you know, yeah. All right, more and more hands are going up. Well, you know, I struggle with math, too, a little bit uh, when I was in high school and even in college. In fact, I'll share something with you. I failed trigonometry in high school for the entire year, okay? That's, that's a big blow to anybody's career. So, you know, how did I get to be an engineer and go into space if I failed trigonometry in high school? And the answer is three words, don't give up. If you want to know what the secret of life is, it, it's not about money and influence and who you know, you know, those things help, but it's really about yourself. And if you want to do something, people will tell you you're not qualified, you can't make it, you're not good enough, don't listen to it. Just keep pounding away in the door and you'll get your way. 
I applied to, the, uh, to get into the electrical engineering uh, program here at Fairley in 1962. And they laughed at me and they said, you know, you don't have high school trigonometry. How can you be an engineer? And I said, whoa. And I was lucky enough that this was, I think, uh, maybe late July. And they had just actually started their summer program. And the trigonometry had been going on for two weeks. But I went in and I arm wrestled with them. And they said, well, since you at least had it in high school, we'll let you into the program. And that was the first of many breaks I received. And I was able to, you know, I, I got an A in the class from summer school. I got into the electrical engineering department. And, you know, uh, I learned that lesson that, you know, don't give up. Don't give up. Just keep pounding away. So, uh, you know, and I learned that lesson in space. And I'll tell you about it at the end, how I almost didn't get into space. And the only way I did is, again, pounding away. So. That's my short introduction. Now that I think the view graphs are up, we can uh, get on to space. A uh, question I'm asked frequently is, how did I get the idea to go into space? And true story, uh, I got it in Starbucks. <laughs> uh, if you're ever looking for me in the morning, I, I live in Princeton uh, now. Uh, just come to print, uh, Starbucks Princeton, and you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, you'll see me with a big coffee and a newspaper. And in June of 2003, I was reading a paper and I came upon the story about space adventures and how they had taken people up into space. And I thought, wow, this is something I'd really like to do. I mean, do you ever have that wow moment when you see something, you know, like the first time I saw a guy with a scuba tank, it was, boy, I wanted to do that. Or some people see someone playing a guitar and say, I want to do that too. And that's what happened to me with, uh, with space. Now, you know, it took me a lot of time to get in. There was a lot of up and downs, but um, that's where I got the idea to start off with. Now, NASA doesn't take private people. Uh, they only take their own trained professional astronauts. So the only way someone like me can get into space is via the Russian Space Agency. All right. So I, uh, I went through the program, and I actually started my training in the year 2004. And as I mentioned, I had over 900 hours of training. Uh, it's very much like being back in college. A typical day for me, up at 6 a.m., run for two miles, have breakfast, classes 9 to 4, more physical training 4 to 6, dinner, homework, go to bed, get up, do it all over again. Sound familiar? All right, well, that's, that's what space training is. And, uh, you know, I mentioned lots of physical training. The hardest thing for me was trying to learn Russian, all right? When you're 60 years old, uh, it's not easy to learn a new language. Remember, Soyuz is a Russian vehicle, so all the commands, all the, the meters are, are in Russian. Now, I had the advantage of, you know, having my research background. I understood vacuum systems and, uh, you know, leak checking and uh, computers and radios, but in a different language, it puts an added twist on. And the other thing is, every week I had to stand for exam. So, you know, I hadn't taken a test in maybe 35 years, and here I was, you know, being asked to uh, show what I was worth. So every Thursday night I got those butterflies in my stomach, just like you do before a, a big exam. Uh, here's just uh, pictures showing our training, uh, some of our running. I'm on the left. Uh, NASA astronaut Bill MacArthur is in the middle in black, and our commander, Valery Tokarev, is on the right in gray. You know, we have a crew of three. So at that time, the normal tour of duty on the space station was two people. Now, they stay for six months, and then a Soyuz, which holds three, uh, brings up the replacement crew, and they always have what the Russians call a space participant who stays on for eight days and then comes back down with the old crew. And that's who I was. Uh, some of the things I went through, here's a picture of me in my space suit. Uh, if you're ever in Princeton, stop by my office on Nassau Street. Uh, I have the space suit. But this is a vacuum system where they pump all the air out and make sure that your space suit uh, doesn't leak. Um, we also had a lot of fire training, because remember, uh, on a spaceship, 
you, you can't run away, you, you know, you can't open windows, you just, if a fire breaks out, you've got to stand and fight it. So we had a lot of training in that. Uh, we also had a lot of survival training. Now, Soyuz lands by parachute. It, it looks a lot like the Apollo capsule, and I'll, I'll show you pictures later. But if we ever have to make an emergency landing or go off course, we could land anywhere on Earth, and since 70% of it is water, you know, we had to train to not only land in water, but survive in there once we were in. We also had survival training, desert, mountains, you know, we had to build our own lean-tos lean from trees, and we, that part was almost like Boy Scout training. But I, I, I enjoyed the training, and it was as much a part of the experience, you know, preparing for the journey as the actual flight. Okay, now, one of the things I did in training is called zero gravity training. And this is to prepare your body for the sense of weightlessness. And what you do is you go up in a plane and then you free fall for about 30 seconds and then pull out and come up. And as you're free falling, you get to float. And you know, here's an example. Uh, you see an instructor taking me over his head and he actually threw me the length of the plane, and another instructor caught me at the other end. Uh, again, this is to get your body used to the sensation of weightlessness. You can actually do that right here on Earth. There's a company called Zero G that will take you up for 15 uh, loops. Uh, you actually get about seven and a half minutes total of weightlessness. And I've done this twice out of LaGuardia since I've come back, and I took my daughter and seven-year-old grandson up once and they both loved it. Just some facts, um, I'll let you read this uh, about the International Space Station. But remember, it's going five miles a second, so it's, it's really zooming along. And the other thing is, since we're making so many orbits, 16, you know, we have 16 sunrises and sunsets every day, so you can't tell time by whether it's light or dark outside. A little bit more information uh, on the lower left. You see a picture of our orbit. We're roughly 51 degrees uh, inclined to the equator, so the Earth, which is spinning uh, easterly, uh, you know, sweeps out a path so that we get to see most everything except the polar regions you know, while we're on the uh, ISS. And finally, if you haven't seen the space station, I, I strongly uh, recommend you do. Just go to the NASA webpage, nasa.gov, and put in sightings. And if you put in this, the town you live in, it will tell you what time and where in the sky you're able to see the ISS. And it just looks like a, a white dot in the sky, and you know it lasts sometimes for three or four minutes. And if you're lucky enough to see it around just before sunrise or just after sunset, you get a really spectacular view as it reflects the sunlight. So. It's a good thing to do. Here's a picture of the Soyuz vehicle uh, being pulled out to the launch pad. The white section is the, what we actually fly in, and everything in gray is rocket. It's a three-stage rocket, burns liquid oxygen and kerosene. You can see the, uh, the Russians are a little more casual uh, you know, about their space vehicles. They, they let people get up and almost touch it. I had 30 friends and family come over for my launch, and you know they, they really enjoyed the whole procedure. Um, you know, here's a view of us walking out to the launch pad. Now, being my age and having grown up t in the Cold War, uh, you know, just imagine having to salute a Russian general before I left. I mean, it was almost a surreal experience, but. Uh, by the way, I was treated extremely well uh, by the Russians, and I got, you know, I have now many Russian f lifetime friends, and uh, that's one of the things I like about FDU and the, you know, this global approach. And I remember even in the early 60s when I was here, the approach was always look out worldwide and global. And in my training, I realized, you know, we didn't think of ourselves as Americans or Russians. We we're space people. We had a mission. And we're always focused on that mission. And you know, all, all of my training was just oriented towards that. And as I say, I uh, I hope in the future, uh, you know, President Obama is going to make some more announcements about a space program. And I hope that 
One of the things we'll be doing is uh, cooperating more and more with the Russians because they have a very good space program, and we're going to have to use them for at least the next five years anyway to get up to the uh, ISS. Here's what it looks like inside the vehicle. It's pretty cramped. It's kind of like Apollo 13, if you've seen the movie. Uh, I'll share another secret with you here. We had to stay in this position for two hours before launch and two hours after. And there's no toilet facility. We all wore huggy diapers, and we all got to use them. So. <laughs> Here's our actual launch. This is October 1st, 2005. In I've watched a number of launches before and after mine, and it's really ear-shattering, uh, ear-shatteringly loud, I should say. Interestingly, inside the vehicle, it was like a dull roar because, first of all, I had earphones on for the radio, uh, I had my visor, and then we had the vehicle, and then we had the shroud protecting the vehicle, so I actually had four layers of sound protection, so we just had this dull roar. Um, you know, when you lift off, it just feels ever so slowly, and then that just increases and increases. And one of the things I learned, you know, in physics, you study mass, acceleration, inertia, and sometimes these are abstract concepts. But, you know, when you get to be the experiment yourself, you, you really learn firsthand uh, what these things are. Here's a photo showing me um, inside the capsule once we're in orbit. Now, it only takes 10 minutes to get into orbit because we accelerate at three and a half times gravity or three and a half Gs, as I said. So we pretty quickly get up to that 17,000 miles an hour. But you can't just crash into the space station. Uh, in fact, we had to make 34 orbits and get to exactly the right uh, velocity and height so that we could dock at the station. So we were in orbit for two days before we could actually dock. But once uh, you're in orbit and everything is leak checked, you can open your space suit and kind of float around the, uh, the capsule a little bit. Here's some video showing what it looks like outside. Uh, sorry, this is our docking. Remember that we're doing this at 17,500 miles an hour. And we're in that spherical section, which is called the habitat module. Our docking was completely automated. It was done by instructions that were sent from the ground up to the uh, Soyuz and stored in the computer. Um, People often ask me, well, what did it feel like in space? And I hope you can tell just from the look on my face in this uh, photograph. You know, when I got on, it was like, wow, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know, how does a guy from Ridgefield Park, New Jersey, get to fly in space? And, you know, every day when I woke up, that's how I felt. The ISS. And then as we go off in a slightly different this direction. Is some video I took. The Earth is just a big blue sphere. Uh, I was telling you someone earlier. Nice picture of the world. There's no sign of life. Here's the Soyuz that I will return on. Top of the transfer chamber. And you can see not only solar cells, but you can see the arm, the robot arm. And another interesting view of the world. If you were a passerby looking down at Earth, you would just say, what a nice blue sphere, and keep going. There's nothing to indicate by looking you know, from this vantage point that there's any life. And even when we use big telephoto lenses you know, that magnify greatly, China, India, United States, it all looks the same. It's mountains, rivers, 
you know, you, you can't tell the difference, and it's, you know, more, uh, one of the things I really appreciated up there was just how global the world is. I mean, we really all are one people, same land, and it's only when you get to that microscopic level that the differences start to show up. So from space, what hits you is how similar we all are, not because you can't see the differences. It's, it's very interesting. Um, we had a ham radio set. Uh, a lot of you probably don't even know what ham radio is, but when I was in high school, we didn't have internet. So if you wanted to communicate with people, you did it with a radio, and it's called amateur radio or ham radio. And if you were lucky, you know, you could talk, if you were in New Jersey, you could talk to someone from California or maybe even Europe. Uh, but ham radio has gotten to be a narrow hobby now, but there is a station up on the ISS, and uh, I did ham radio sessions with Ridgefield Park High School, where I graduated, uh, Princeton High School, where I live now, and Fort Hamilton High in Brooklyn, New York, uh, near where I was born. Shows you how you drink water in space. I've got a water fountain on my hand. Fluids will assume a spherical form in a weightless environment. You can see some of the uh, reasons why there are uh, no showers and no sinks uh, up on the space station. Um, you know, we use wet wipes in the morning to keep ourselves clean. Now, I was only up for 10 days, so it's like a long camping trip, and you know you could tolerate it. But imagine if you were staying for six months. It's, uh, the other treat we had once a week, we had these uh, dry shampoos like you, you use in hospitals where you some kind of a lotion, and you, you, know, you scrub your hair, and it gets kind of soapy, and then you take a towel and dry yourself off, and then you leave the towel out to dry. And it's dried by, we, you know, we have circulating fans that reclaim the water. <clears throat> okay, next is a demonstration of how you eat in space. Today, we have either canned goods or dehydrated foods. This is cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev. Holds the world's record 803 no, days in space. <laughs> During my training uh, for one week, I only ate space foods. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I had to go to a special room, and they would, you know, give me all di each day a different type of food, and I would grade them from one to ten, ten being best. And they told me that anything I ranked five or under, they they wouldn't send up to me. So I had this idea that they're going to pack these lunches. You know, it says Greg Wednesday and Thursday and so forth. When I got up there, there was so much food. There was a wall longer than this with just suitcases full of food. And when I got on board, the Russian Commander Krikalev says, just take whatever you want, Greg. <laughs> so I proceeded to you know, chow down on the NASA shrimp cocktails, which were pretty good. Hey, I'm recording, watching you open your Slim Jim. This is astronaut John Phillips taking this video. He had brought snacks. Slim Jims are not part of the NASA diet. You know, should the counter be counting, the time counter? It's not. It says record, but it's not counting. Even astronauts can't use video cameras. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in on the Slim Jim. Recording. 
Here's Greg typing as you can only do it in zero G. We actually had now, if email. If you notice, it's kind of interesting. Just the pressure of his fingertips on the keyboard lifts him up to the ceiling. How about that? As he slowly disappears into all the storage containers. Through radio communication with satellites, we're actually able to send emails down to Earth. That's not easy. I had to practice that several times. This is just going along in the opposite direction. You all know Newton's law. It says a body in motion tends to remain in motion. That's what inertia is. And you can see a demonstration of it right there. Notice I'm dressed t-shirt, shorts, and socks. It's inside the station. It's very comfortable. We have sea level uh, air pressure, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, normal uh, humidity. Uh, you don't need shoes because you don't have weight. You know, there's nothing bearing down on your feet, so no need for heavy shoes. Everybody wants to know, how do you go to the bathroom in space? So. At least I'll show you the facility. This is the famous space toilet that has failed a number of times up on the ISS. Uh, John Phillips is yep. the astronaut who's been there for six space months, the guy in the flowery shirt. The two world famous astronauts, NASA astronauts. You see them on TV. <laughs> you want to know what space work is really like? <laughs> Have a look. Bill MacArthur is doing the installation because he just arrived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unstick any pipe with that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh-huh. And there's the completed job. Now, you notice that hose with the yellow funnel on? That's what both male and female uh, astronauts use to urinate. Uh, That's what it looks like open. It's a vacuum cleaner hose, you know, with the suction pulls the liquid in. Uh, the space toilet, I'm not going to get too graphic about it, but uh, I'll just point out two things. Number one, the opening is smaller, so you have to think about centering yourself. <laughs> and, and secondly, gravity is not helping you here. So. <laughs> Take, takes a little bit of getting used to. Uh, I often get asked, how do you sleep in space? And the answer is any way you want, because obviously there is no upside down. I mean, you could sleep with your head here or your head there, and you'll feel the same. Um, we sleep in a sleeping bag, and the important thing is that you tie the sleeping bag to a wall or a pole because, you know, if you don't, you'll float around like that Slim Jim. I found sleep very restful. Um, and you'd normally sleep like this because your arms have no weight. And it's actually easier to hold them out here than it is down there. I had a company, Sensors Unlimited. We did a video down link so our employees could see their cameras. Nothing inside. These cameras are used to uh, see in the dark you know, for night vision and other such applications. Recording. Uh, this shows a box of chips. These are like computer chips that convert the infrared or heat into a video signal. And those 20 chips, which have sticky substance on the back, uh, I brought back from my uh, engineers and made cufflinks for them. All right, for all the physicists, uh, this is a demo of moment of inertia. And of course, you, you probably did this in your uh, physics classes with a notebook. You see two of the axes are stable. 
the rotation about them are. Now watch this. That doesn't like to rotate about that axis. You try it at home. Yeah, not stable. That one is. Two of the axes are stable and one isn't, and I can't remember the reason for that. I hope old Prof. Uh, Ralph Howtow will forgive me. I took his uh, celestial mechanics course 45 years ago, and I had forgotten what the Euler conditions of uh, motion are, and that's what they predict which axes are stable and which ones aren't. The next couple of view graphs just show how we go about undocking uh, from the station and coming back down. Uh, this was from roughly, this is a NASA photo from around 2005. The station looks a lot different now because a lot more has been added from these recent shuttle flights and essentially it's built out now. It's a total of about 130 kilowatts of solar uh, panels on so it does look quite different. But you see us slowly pulling away and of course I came down on a different Soyuz than I arrived on. So the first thing I had to do when we docked is take my spacesuit and seat out of the old Soyuz and put it into the new one. Uh, now, space is a vacuum, you know, there's no air and we're zooming, you know, 17,000 miles an hour, no problems, but when we come back down to the atmosphere, you know, the, we're going to have friction with the air, which is going to heat things up a lot. So, we jettison the e engine and also the habitat module and we come down in that the center descent module, which has a heat shield on. And once you enter the atmosphere at speeds like that, uh, the air gets heated to thousands of degrees Celsius, and anything that's not heat shielded will burn. So those are the engine and the habitat module, which is loaded with garbage, all burn up. And uh, what we're doing here is we're actually converting the kinetic energy into heat energy. So as we're producing more and more heat, we're slowing down. And when we get to a few hundred miles an hour, we're able to deploy the parachute. And this is how we come down in Kazakhstan. We come down on dry land. And I was fortunate we had a good landing. Um, didn't have any issues. And within 10 minutes, the search and rescue team had found us. Um, after you've been weightless for 10 days, you tend to be dizzy. It's like when you kind of spin yourself around 10 times and you, know, you, you sort of feel like you're floating. So they treated us like invalids, and we were quarantined, me for three days and the other two for three weeks because they were weightless for a longer period of time. And even though I could walk out on my own, um, you know, they still, again, treated me like a medical invalid for several days. Um, you know, what did I learn from all this? Well, I told you the story about how I was 16 and failed trigonometry in high school. Well. You know, I mentioned that I started my training in 2004, but, you know, if you picked up on it, I didn't fly till October 2005. You know, it's a year and a half later. And what happened was during my training, I, w I was in Russia for two months, and they took a lung x-ray and found a little black spot on my lung. And they said, oh, sorry, guy, you're, you're out, disqualified. And, I mean, I was devastated because I told everybody here, hey, I'm going to space, I'm going to space. And, now I come back and everyone's asking me, we thought you were in space. No, you know, I had this black spot on my lung and I had to tell the story a couple of hundred times and believe me, it wasn't fun. Um, so anyway, the spot turned out to be harmless. It went away. I got a note from my doctor. Go to the Russians, I'm ready to fly again. Yet. Next month, same thing. X-rays, letters, yet, yet, right? Nine months I reapplied, nine times and every time got rejected. Finally, after my ninth time in May of 2005, the Russian doctors let me back in the program and I got to fly. So the lesson I learned when I was 60 years old was the same one I learned when I was uh, 16 in high school. If you really want to do something, right, don't give up. Thanks very much and I'd be glad to answer questions. <laughs> Was, yeah, one last pitch from my book, which is outside. You know, the story of how I started and sold my company, how, kind of how I grew up from Richfield Park to starting companies and how I got into space is talked about in the book.
Anybody yes. who wants to uh, ask Dr. Olson a question, you want to come on over here, and we'll give you the microphone. Uh, so uh, the people who are watching this on the web, this is being streamed worldwide, and especially to our folks in Vancouver, uh, can hear the question. Greg, uh, America seems to be heading toward simulation in everything. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a very practical background. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought of where we're going with it and what's going to happen. Uh, all we can do now in America is operate keyboards. We can't build anything. We can't do anything practical. Well, I, you know, I, I simulation and modeling is great. I mean, the, the, we really didn't have these tools when I was a student, you know, 45 years ago, and we do now. And it can, modeling can save a lot of work. So I'm all for it to that extent. What I'm not for is people who just leave it at that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a tinkerer. I like to build stuff on the bench. But, you know, modeling and simulation can help you when you build your first prototype to, you know, instead of being an order of magnitude off, maybe now you're only 30% off and you can, uh, you know, more closely get to it. But, uh, yeah, I can't overemphasize what I think uh, the importance of, you know, practical training. One of the lucky things that happened to me when I was studying electrical engineering here in the 60s, my dad was an electrician in Local 3 in New York, and he was able to get me a summer job. So for four years, I worked as an apprentice electrician, and believe me, I really learned what grounding is and, uh, you know, what contact resistance and things like that. So, you know, I had a good practical uh, background in addition to all the lab courses I taught. Um, and, and, you know, I, I hope the lab courses are still as good now as when I was a student here. Um, being up in space, uh, do your muscles degenerate because you're not doing exercise? Uh, y yes, they do. Now, we uh, exercise for two and a half hours every day. Uh, we have a treadmill, we have spring weights, uh, and uh, one other form of exercise will come to me, uh, a bicycle resistance. But you say, hey, wait a minute, treadmill, how, how can you walk a treadmill in a weightless environment? And what we do is we, put a, we have a harness that's spring-loaded to the floor, so the springs are pulling you down to the floor as you walk. So that keeps your muscles reasonably in, in tone, not all of them, but you know, your major muscles. The problem is your bones, because even though two and a half hours a day is a lot of exercise, what about the other 21 and a half? Your bones are not being pulled on. Like all of us, our muscles are pulling on our bones to keep the head straight and sitting up. You don't have that in space. And after a while, your bones start to degenerate. And that's more of a problem than the, mus the muscle degeneration you can uh, deal with, but uh, a number of astronauts who have been long time in space have reported joint problems, arthritis, and things like that. And it's something they still don't have a real cure for. Hi, Dr. Olson. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for coming and thank you for a thoroughly enjoyable presentation. I actually had two questions. One, uh, what language is the equipment on the space station? And and also, how did you get to keep your spacesuit? Uh, good, good questions. First of all, on the space station, everything is in two languages, English and Russians. Vikluchit, on, off, you know, so you know what, what the switch is. Um, on Soyuz, which is a Russian vehicle, it's all Russian, okay? But on the space station, by international agreement, uh, you know, the, the main language is English. But since the Russians built the first two modules, it's, it's basically bilingual. Um, what was the second part? Uh, space suit. It took me a year to get my space suit back. You know, the Russians view that as high technology, and they have some export issues. So it took a lot of arm twisting and pleading and, you know, calling up various people. But eventually I got it. And as a bonus, I got my seat as well. <laughs> And again, if anyone comes to Princeton, please stop by my office and have a look at it. I'm going to interrupt here for a second. Sure. Because I have a question for you, and I wanted to share a gift that you gave me. Oh. And it really had frames. 
Uh, this is a, uh, this is my office, and I invite you to come. I invite you to come and take a look at it. But it's a photograph of Dr. Olson carrying a banner that says Fairleigh Dickinson University in the capsule. Shot that, and he uh, presented me with this banner. And I have a question that, and I actually know the answer, but I'd like you to explain. There is a stamp right here. Yes. And what does that stamp signify? Okay, that stamp on the flag is actually the official postal stamp of the International Space Station. So I stamped the flag to prove that indeed it had flown in space. So. Thank you. Yes. FDU had to provide me with two flags for that mission. The first one was used for destructive testing. You know, they burn it and melt it and put it in high temperatures to make sure that it didn't give off a lot of toxic vapors. Hi, Dr. Olson. My name is Gonzalo Perez, and we invited a lot of high school students here today and uh, in the hopes of you inspiring them to choose STEM as a career. Is there anything else you can say to kind of, you know, solidify the point of uh, STEM as a career in the future? Yeah you can make an awful lot of money. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 the only re the reason I say that is because people think, well, you know, I want to study business and banking and, you know, because that's how you get rich. If you're an engineer, you just have this dull job and you don't make a lot of money. And that is totally untrue. Uh, first of all, not just me, but I can point to dozens of FDU grads that have done very well financially in the sciences and engineering. And amongst my peers, you know, I'm active in IEEE, the Electrical Engineers Organization. Thousands and thousands of uh, Americans with uh, technical degrees have done very well financially. But here's the best part of it. You know, I'm 65 years old. I love it. I still, last week I was at a conference in uh, San Francisco. Monday and Tuesday I was down at Virginia Tech, who were who very good with power electronics. They're doing work on silicon carbide transistors. And still, the, you know, the basic solid state physics that I learned here in the, in the 60s and the courses I took with uh, uh, Prof. Brin and Prof. Schick to learn electronics. Prof. Gloria Reinisch was, uh, was here uh, while I was a student. And I mean, those things are still in my head. And I, you know, I love doing it. And I, to me, that's the greatest part of science and engineering. But that's a little, sometimes a little difficult to get through, especially to younger people. But the money works. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, uh, Mike Toomey. Um, first, I want to thank you very much for your contributions, both in money and time. We really appreciate it. And uh, as, uh, as an entrepreneur, and I know there are a lot of them out there, this is inspiring. So thank you again. I just had a quick question. What's next for you? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, it's just to keep going. I, you know, I don't have, I would love to go back into space, but I have to sell another company first. And <laughs> <laughs> so I got to wait for the economy to pick up. You know, Space Adventures has a, a trip where you can, for a mere $100 million, you can make, on Soyuz, make one orbit around the moon and come back down. And who wouldn't love to do that? <laughs> but, you know, maybe I'll have to sell two or three companies to get there. Hi, Dr. Olson. Uh, as you shared about your space, uh, can we know about your uh, success story as an entrepreneur? Uh, yes, I started and sold two high-tech companies. Now, after I got my degrees, I went to work for RCA Laboratories. Um, when I got out of graduate school, there were many, many big industrial labs, Bell Labs, General Electric, RCA, IBM, Hewlett Packard, dozens more. Unfortunately, that's not available for the most part anymore. I mean, I was so lucky. I did an apprenticeship at RCA Labs for 11 years, and I was around people like Vladimir Zworkin, who helped uh, invent uh, the color picture tube. And, and uh, you know, color TV was invented, at a, uh, or uh, sorry, the commercial color TV was developed at RCA Labs. Great place to be, you know, to learn. You just soak up the knowledge. But in 1983, I started my first company, Epitax. I sold that, started another one, sold that, bought it back, sold it again. And, and now I do what's called angel investing, which is, you know, I, I try and help other uh, high tech and other companies get started. Hi. Um, were you scared flying into space? Honestly, I was not scared. Um, it was kind of the, the opposite. Well, I should say, yeah, I was scared. I was scared of anybody in a white coat with a stethoscope. <laughs> 
I, because they had kept me from reaching my dream once, and even, you know, after that, that picture you saw with the Russian generals, after I, as I was walking out to the launch pad, I'm still wondering if I'm going to feel that tap on the shoulder, you know, because we have a medical harness, and maybe my heartbeat is too high or something like that. So when I felt that rocket start to shake, it was like, yes, the next 10 days belong to me, and nobody can take it away. So I, I, I was really happy the whole time. Any more questions? Sure. Right, come on over here. Come on. Um, will you be at the regional uh, IEEE conference uh, at Temple University this weekend? Uh, this weekend, no. Uh, but I go to a lot of IEEE functions, and I, I do get down to that area. I think I've given two space talks there. Greg, what were some of the failures, things that failed or mm -hmm. events or activities that were planned and failed on the space, on your adventure? Um, well, I mean, I told you about the, my medical one. It was, you know, from my point of view, the biggest failure. Uh, and I mean, I bet everybody in this room has had something like you fail a major test where you don't qualify, you wanted to get on the baseball team and you weren't selected. You know, you've had some kind of rejection uh, like I had in space. I was, my hopes were so high. Wow, I'm going to get to fly in space. And now someone says, sorry, guy, you can't do it anymore. Just devastating. And one of the things I learned is you got to just keep going. As lousy as you feel, and believe me, I felt lousy. You just got to keep going. Um, you know, other than that, um, I, you know, one time I, I knew the... Uh, the electrical system very well. In fact, the Russians told me I knew it better than some of the astronauts. But when I had my exam, we, you know, there was a little mix-up with the interpreter, and uh, they almost uh, failed me on that test. And that would have been a huge ego blow to me, but somehow we got it straightened out. Not too much went wrong otherwise. I mean, when we came down, we had an air leak in the cabin. And I mean, that, that was serious because if, you know, if we lost the air, we'd have to use our emergency reserve. And uh, one of my jobs was to open the oxygen valve to you know, keep the pressure up. And I found that in a way, when you're uh, re-entering and you have all these G-forces, it's very difficult to hold that valve open, especially with space gloves. But I said to myself, I don't care if my hand falls off, I'm not letting go of this. And, you know, other than those two things, that, that was really the only thing of a failure nature. Yes, uh, Lois Gordon. I know you studied space and time and mm -hmm. volume and so forth, and you experienced it differently when you were in space. I mm -hmm. just wondered if now that you have returned, your perception of these, of space and time, has changed. Um. I don't know that of space and time, uh, because now I, you know, I didn't get near the speed of light. So that, although I, I was asked the question of, uh, you know, how much younger I was, but I had anticipated the question, and I was two microseconds younger from the, after the ten days I spent. Um, you know, I so, well, I, yes, you know, time did warp me. The, the, the way night and day changed, it's like, wow, how, how can night and day only be an hour and a half? But, you know, you quickly adapt to it. And by the tenth day, it's, oh, you know, it's just, uh, we call it the eclipse. I mean, it's basically light, and now it's getting dark. We say, oh, it's the eclipse. <laughs> and, and you just get used to it, just like you get used to uh, that's down and this is up. Um, but, you know, the kind of... I think momentum and inertia are the concepts that I really grasped when I was on there. You know, when you, uh, I have a picture of me holding a, uh, what on earth is a 350 pound battery and I have it balanced, uh, you know, on my finger. But, you know, if you go to the wall, you know, that, that's not going to stop by itself. And, the, you know, the recoil of when you hit the wall really tells you what mass and inertia are. Good afternoon, Mr. Olson. I'm Elizabeth Marte, a Union City High School student. I was wondering, the day before the takeoff, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? Oh, I was <laughs> just super high. Uh, 
uh, I'm saying like, wow, this is really going to happen now. Because, you know, I always was overshadowed by that medical thing. And, you know, anyone who's a pilot, training and pilot, especially in the military, will tell you the doctor is your enemy. I mean, that's kind of an exaggeration. But, you know, we used to think of a doctor as your friend, a person who supports you, a person who will help you in times of need. If you're training for a flight mission, a doctor is someone that can knock you out and do it rather quickly also. So I, I remember one time I had a cold and you know, we had weekly medical exams and I stayed under the shower for about 30 minutes with hot water just trying to drain my sinuses and uh, you know, they, they asked me how it was, you know, I, I feel great <laughs> even though I had this cold. So you know, we tended to hide things medically. I, I strained my arm one time, and I, I, you know, I never told anybody because who knows, maybe this could lead to a dismissal. All right. Um, hi, my name is Christopher. I'm from Union City High School as well. And one of my questions was, um, what made you come to Fairleigh Dickinson High School, I mean, Fairleigh Dickinson University instead of anybody else? Sure. Well, I, I live four miles away from here, and I didn't have a car. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was one driving force. Uh, I knew people uh, who had been here. I didn't have the option of going to MIT and, you know, places like this. So uh, I found a home here. And uh, well, Fairleigh Dickinson was one of the best things that ever happened to me, believe me. Uh, it turned my life around. And the reason I'm standing up here talking about all these things is I spent six years at Fairleigh Dickinson. It prepared me for life. So I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. Um. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Horsey, and I'm from Union City High School. And uh, yeah, Union City High School. And I was wondering if you could be anything else. What would it be? Because you know how you're a famous entrepreneur and all that. Like, if you could be anything else, like in your uh, younger years, because you're a young man. Just saying, in your younger years, um, if you could be anything else, what would it be? And uh, also, just curious, but are you related to the Olsen twins? Because of your last name. All right. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm not related. Uh, Ol Olsen is a very common Norwegian name. Uh, if I could do anything else, I'd play first base for the Yankees. Uh, my name is Adriano, and I come from Union City High School, and I just wanted to know if you actually suffered of something that I think it's called uh, space madness or space disease. Or like your stomach, you can't really eat because your stomach's messed up? Oh, space sickness. Oh. It's really motion sickness. No, I, I was one of the fortunate people. Uh, I did not have any uh, motion sickness. In fact, I served as a guinea pig for the European Space Agency. I did some experiments in space. And when I came back, uh, they put me in a centrifuge for an hour. And I had to rotate my head and do all kinds of things. And I had a a stop button, and they said, all right, as soon as you feel sick, just press the button, and fortunately, I, I, I don't seem to be subject to motion sickness, and I have a theory why. I, I have a poor sense of direction. You know, I, I do. I have to go someplace three or four times before I know. I don't have the common male disease, though. I always ask directions, <laughs> and I've found, and I bet if I went around the room and I said, how many of you have a good sense of direction? And the hands will go up, and I said, now, do you get motion sickness? And I find a lot of people with a good sense of direction do get motion sickness. It has to do with your vestibular system, you know, your inner ear, which now gravity is the reference, right? These little cilia, the little hairs inside knows where gravity is. And a weightless environment doesn't know, and that can, uh, w whenever your body is disoriented, one of the symptoms is, you know, you'll get sick because it's maybe you have bad food in your stomach. So uh, about 40% of people that go into space get some kind of motion sickness. They can't predict who will and who won't get it. Um, you know, it's one of NASA's frustrations. Um, but it's, you know, it ranges from just slight headaches to, you know, out and out sickness. Um, hi, Dr. Olson. My name is Christian Perry. You're from University High School. And um, my question was, um, throughout this entire adventure that you've gone through, um, and very successful, and was there a point where you reached the struggle, or a point where you just wanted to give up? And if so, like what made you get back onto what you were doing? The answer is yes, many times. Uh, 
you know, one of the problems with giving talks like this is it all sounds so great, and it is great, but I'm, I'm giving you the, the top 10%, you know, and I'm kind of sparing you the uh, uh, underlying 90%, sure, both in starting my businesses as well as in space. I mean, imagine when after the eighth time of applying to the Russians, and they said, Nyet, get out of here, really brusquely. I, I kind of thought that was it. I mean, this is probably, you know, you, you've fought the good fight, and this doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And, I mean, my business is actually, I've, you know, my last business I sold, bought back, and sold again. And all three times we had to do salary reductions, and we faced, like, financial disaster, like many of you have. And I, I just, there's something about me that even though I feel just as lousy as anybody else when the bad time comes, I, I can just force myself to, uh, it's just, maybe that's the faith that I have, just keep going. I don't know where, what's going to happen, but just keep going on, and, and, you know, that's what gets me through it. But yes, I've had plenty of uh, bad stuff happen in, in my businesses and space mission. Hi, my name is Julia Crespo from the Union City High School. My question is, why, how did your professor influence you to name him at, from this university? Like, why him and not any other teacher? Oh, well, that's a very good question because, I mean, you know, I, there, I had so many great professors in, in physics and electrical engineering. You know, I, I hesitate to name them for fear that I'm going to, you know, uh, omit somebody who's key. But, um, you know, in the 1960s, Fairley Dickinson had a very good engineering and, and physics department. Uh, and, you know, when I got my degrees and went down to Virginia, I could compete. And I'm not a I'm reasonably okay, but I'm no genius. I could compete with students from all around the world, from the California schools, from MIT and other places, and I found out, you know, I had a very good grounding. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I like the education here. I'm, I'm not sure that answers your question fully. What was the other part? Why, why him and not any of your other professors? Oh, yes. Um, well, I think uh, Professor Haza was, he was my uh, thesis advisor. So when I did my the and I trained for two years, um, just around the corner, we used to have what we called the research center on Van Orden Place. And we had a little General Electric electron diffraction machine. It's something like an x-ray machine. And Dr. Haza kind of was my introduction to real experimental physics. The other one, Dr. Gildart, I had in my senior year for physical electronics and solid state physics. And he introduced me to the field that I really spent most of my professional life on, which is solid state physics. Hi, I'm Fred Clark. I'm an uh, undergraduate EE. Um, and my question is, what do you think the, what would you name as the top three industries to come out with a, you know, startup business in today's market? Phew. Well, I always, uh, if I, I'll name three. I don't know if they're the top three or, or, or in that order. I mean, right now, hey, nuclear, go to any nuclear power station. All right, go talk to public service, and you ask them, are there jobs down in, in Salem or uh, at Forked River at their nuclear plants? And the answer is yes. There are jobs to engineers, accountants, uh, salespeople, marketing. You'd be amazed. You know, that's one. Uh, anything related to energy, not just solar, but you see how the, uh, the smart grid is coming back. And uh, even though I'm not a financial person or even in favor of that, uh, all indications are on Wall Street that they're going to start hiring again, and that, that will probably be many thousands of new jobs this year. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Hodges. I am a physician. Listen very carefully to what you've said about us. <laughs> but, but, but I'm also a school board member at the Patterson School System. Our children are benefiting from your uh, largesse and your Saturday program here at, F at FDU. And I, and I just wanted to, to thank you for that. And, and um, the other thing is, have there been any studies on altitude sickness and the correlation possible correlation between sickness and space? 
Uh, you know, I, short answer is I don't know. That, that's a very interesting question because um, I know I have had, uh, if I go out like skiing to Taos, which is about 10,000 feet high, if I just suddenly go there, I'll get headaches. I, I don't get sick. Um, but the short answer, I don't know the answer to that. It would be an interesting thing. That, that's somewhat of a mystery. And, uh, you know, I was at a conference once of a room like this. There were almost 300 physicians that specialize in space medicine. So it's, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, hi, my name is Alejandra Ramos. I'm from Union City High School. If you hadn't been accepted into a fairly Dickinson University, where, like, would you have seen yourself? Well, this is a true story. It's in my book. I actually didn't want to go to college when I was in high school. Uh, I was going to join the Army. And in 1962, if you didn't know what you wanted to do, that was an option because you joined the Army to see the world. That's what the posters said. You know, so if you went to the Army, you could get to go to Korea or Germany and just kind of enjoy the next couple of years and bum around the world. So that was my plan. I went down, I took the test, and I passed. And, but I was just 17 when I got out of high school, so I needed my parents' consent. And I remember I handed the form to my father. And my father and I, my, my father was a, the tough guy, you know, my way or the highway. You know, he, he was an electrician. He had hands like vice grips. Uh, you know, and didn't, you didn't reason with him a debate. So normally he would have said, why do you want to do something stupid like that? And I probably would have forged his name or something. And, and instead he said to me, you know, you wanted to go into the union, his, his electrician's union. He said, but you know, it's getting hard and they may require six months of college. And to this day, I don't know if he made that up or not, but he <laughs> said, why don't you try going to college and if you don't like it in six months, I'll sign the paper. It was so reasonable, so unlike my father. I didn't know what else to say, but okay. And that's why I'm here, and who knows what would have happened if, if uh, he didn't sign that paper. I am Michael Mejeda. I <coughs> graduate engineering, so electrical engineering soon. And I have a question. Mm -hmm. So although you went to Fairleigh Dickinson for six years, to go for your PhD, like, why exactly did you pick University of Virgin Virginia, or like what is it that got you to select University of Virginia to uh, go for your PhD versus like any other? I can tell you that's sort of, and it, this is also right out of my book. Um, this organization, IEEE, the Electrical Engineers Organization, uh, where the Time Warner Center is in New York, that used to be the New York Coliseum, and it would have trade shows there. And every May, IEEE would have, you know, all uh, they display power supplies and, uh, and things like that. And they give out free pens and pocket protectors. So as students, we'd go over there just to glom on all the freebie stuff. And uh, University of Virginia had a little stand. And uh, a guy named Professor Avery Catlin came up and said, hey, kid, come here. <laughs> you know, like, have you ever thought of Virginia? No, why don't you take a trip down here? And uh, do you know about Thomas Jefferson? And I hardly knew about him back then. And that's, it's a true story, and that's why I went down to Virginia. And I found my life has had a number of gates like that. You know, I didn't think deeply about Virginia and research it and so forth. It was just that chance meeting of Prof. Catlin at a booth. And who knows if I woke up that day with a headache and didn't go to the Coliseum, where I might have gone or what I might have done. But, you know, just follow your life wherever it leads you. A great presentation today. Thank you. One more? Okay. Hi, Dr. Olson. I would like to thank you first of all. And I have two questions. Uh, I'm a dentist, so that uh, gives one uh, question arising, like how did you maintain your oral hygiene over there? Uh, very good question. Um, we brush our teeth the same way um, take a, we have a straw, a special straw, and you take a sip of water and it's one of these, uh, it's like a check valve, it only opens up when you press on it. So you get a mouthful of water, uh, toothpaste sticks to the brush so that you don't have to worry about it floating. Brush your teeth the same way. Now here comes the challenge, what do you do with all that foam in your mouth? 
and you really have two choices. Some people swallow it. Most people like me, you take a Kleenex and spit it out and put it in the disposal that's, you know, locked up and doesn't float around. So that's how we have basic hygiene and floss, of course. Mm -hmm. Ah, a cut. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and I did bump myself. I didn't have a serious cut, but I uh, twice drew blood. Um, you know, blood does with normal people. I mean, if you know, as long as you're iron and so forth, it's okay. Blood coagulates pretty quickly, but there's a certain amount of surface tension that, you know, the blood would rather. It's a lower surface tension to, you know, adhere to your skin than be surrounded by air. But if you're bleeding fairly profusely, yes, it will go off just like those water droplets. And um, you know, so we're instructed if you do cut yourself to obviously hold, put a bandage or a, a, a towel, Kleenex, whatever, and, and hold it. Which is why, as you can imagine, there's a lot of medical analysis. So you know, they're they're measuring all these things while you're on Earth about your blood. Like if you if you were uh, slow, I think what is it? If, if your iron, your platelets are off, you know, some people, if you cut them instead of stopping in a minute, you know, can bleed for 10 minutes. It's not hemophilia, but they don't clot as regularly. And if you didn't clot within a certain time, you couldn't go into space. So, Okay, Dr. Olson, we have two more uh, people to ask you questions, one on this side and one over there. Okay. Dr. John Cowan, uh, I'm over here, yeah. uh, FDU professor. Uh, I'm just curious, is this wonderful video available to other students? Is it accessible generally? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's on the laptop here, and you're welcome to it. Okay, the final question. I got two questions. Uh, Uh, growing up, uh, did you have any role models? Oh, boy, you know, I, they tended to be sports figures like many people. And, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but my dad was a big role model. And why do I say that? Because I find now, I said I'm 65 years old, a lot of the things I do, a lot of the ways I act are exactly like him. My sisters say to me, that's daddy. You know, and, you become your father to a certain extent. I mean, from the day I can remember, four years old, I'd follow my father around with his toolbox. He used to do odd jobs on weekend, you know, make extra money, do electrical work. And, you know, from day one, I was uh, holding his pliers and, you know, he'd let me twist wires. And, you know, to this day, I have a sense of identity with that. And, you know, it made it worthwhile for me. Uh, and, uh, last question. Is it possible if I take a picture with you for my Facebook? Absolutely. 